Okay, great. We might still have a few people join us, but we're going to go ahead and get going today. So welcome to this webinar, uh, training to better understand the wildlife species that appear on your wildlife cameras. And you're in really good hands with our wildlife specialist, Megan Bethel. Want to thank our donors, volunteers, and partners who have been making our work to protect the diversity of life and lands in the Sky Island region for the last 30 years possible. So thank you for all you're doing. I want to acknowledge that the Skyland Alliance office here in Tucson is on the land of Tohono O'odham, Pascua, Yaqui, and other indigenous peoples. Our work throughout the Skyland region on both sides of the US-Mexico border takes place on indigenous land. And here at Skyland Alliance, we acknowledge the, the lack of truth and reconciliation with native nations. Our organization is committed to continuing to educate ourselves about this process and mobilizing to stand in solidarity with present day tribes and in support of indigenous people who are acting to restore their rights and to protect the land we all call home. We invite you to join us in this effort and please visit our website for resources that can help guide this process. Today our recording is being, uh, our training is being recorded and we will be circulating the link later today. If you've registered for this via Zoom, you'll be getting it in an email. We'll also be sharing it on our website. You can find that on our homepage under webinars. And also we can share it on social media and our newsletter. If you're joining us live on Zoom or Facebook right now, please feel free to enter any questions that you have about the amazing wildlife information that you're learning from Megan into the chat. We'll be monitoring for those. And, I'm, and I will um, help guide our Q&A with Megan as we go through the presentation and can do more general questions we'll probably hold until the end. We will ask you to stay muted during the presentation if you're joining us live, um, but feel free to use that chat window at the bottom of the screen as often as you'd like. And without any further ado, we are being led through this wildlife uh, class today by Megan Bethel. She's our wildlife specialist. Megan has been looking at wildlife photos and identifying them from wildlife cameras for 10 years. She's looked at literally millions of photographs and she's taught me about 99% of what I know about the animals in our region. So I think uh, you're gonna learn a lot from her today. You're probably gonna wanna watch this webinar multiple times. I know I am. <laughs> so thank you so much, Megan, for sharing your knowledge with us. And I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Emily. And good morning, everyone. I'm excited to help uh, you guys learned so hopefully it's something new or to refresh your memory on how to identify the amazing wildlife here. And these are going to be based on species found specifically in the Sky Island region. Um, we have a very unique ecosystem and there are some animals that might not appear um, elsewhere in the world. So we're just going to focus here. So today we're going to cover a variety of topics. Um, we're going to start with canines, go to cats and cover some other mammals. We're going to look at briefly at birds, and then we're going to shift into some of the harder species that are hard to tell apart, like jackrabbits, squirrels, deer, and skunks. So you want to tune in until the end to really get the information with those tricky species. And we're focusing a lot on mammals because the cameras are um, built to detect larger animals like mammals that have a heat signature. So that's why a lot of these animals are actually mammals. So before we begin, I just wanted to give some general advice. So when you look at a wildlife camera picture, it's, uh, it's a snapshot of what you're seeing in the landscape. So in order to look at the animal, you want to look at the surrounding landscape for scale. Look at the trees and the rocks and the, where it is, where the animal is in that shot. Something in the distance might be a lot larger based on the tree or something you're looking at. Also, get familiar with your local wildlife. Um, a lot of the animals that you might think it is are not even in the area. It could be based on elevation or range or even vegetation type. Um, some of the animals we're going to cover later look very similar but are found at completely different elevations. And unless you have a field guide or Google it, you won't know. Um, so I really recommend doing some research as well. And if you really um, don't know, just use your best educated guess. The, these pictures are not always great. And if you think it looks like a rabbit, 
or you're not quite sure what species, it's okay just to say jackrabbit species. Um, it's perfectly fine. Because this is practice, it's an art form, it's a skill, and I recommend practicing, practicing, practicing. If you have a wildlife camera, it's a great way to test it out. Even as you like go through the internet, practice your ID skills, and you see a picture pop up, um, test your knowledge. So let's begin. First, we're gonna start with the canines. And I'm gonna have everyone participate in the chat. Look at this picture of a coyote and what, what makes it a coyote? Type in the traits you see um, that stand out that makes it look like this animal. Maybe Emily, can you do you, what people are typing in the chat for me, please? Okay, we're getting lanky and tall ears, thin snout. Perfect. Skinny. That's perfect. So it's really important for everyone here to have their own view of these animals. I'm going to be lecturing a lot on what I look at and what I see, but that might not be the trait that you as an individual will focus on. Um, so like as the chat was saying, the coyotes are um, pretty iconic with their long lanky legs, they have their body high off the ground. They're about the size of a medium sized dog, but you can tell much apart from a dog by their large, large ears and their very pointed snout. They, that, those iconic big ears is what I look for a lot. Also, if you have a nice daytime photo, you can see these white and black patch kind of like as a saddle on their back. That's a good thing to tell apart from other dog species. Um, another trait that distinguishes them from other canines we'll cover a little bit is, <clears throat> excuse me, their tail doesn't reach the ground. They're a lot taller than their tail. And I'll go over why that's important in a second. Um, but coyotes are one of the most common species that are across the landscape and you'll probably come across them on camera. So it's good to recognize them. So here's another little interactive thing. It's the second most common canine in this region. It's a gray fox. So you type in the chat again, what, what do you see that makes this a fox versus a coyote? Giant tail. Yeah. Stripe. Like their coat is a little different. Very cool. So this is going to be a long this body. question. Sorry, what was it? Oh, we're also just getting a lot, a lot of more comments. The color and the size, the length of the tail and the fur coloration, stubby legs. And someone said more elegant. Sorry, Coyote. <laughs> Exactly. Um, that was a gorgeous photo of a fox. Not, not all of them are going to be that nice. Um, but the gray foxes are not all gray. They have these nice orange sides, the gray flecked coat. But their most distinguishing feature is their long tail. They're a lot, it's a lot longer than a coyote's. And compared to their body, it's much longer than they are tall. So in comparison, the gray fox have much shorter legs, a lot longer tail. And they are more cat-like. They're, they're a canine, but due to their fox nature, um, they tend to act more like cats. And most of the time they're nocturnal. So if you have a black and white camera, these two night photos that are in black and white are probably what you're going to be seeing. So you won't see the gray. So the feature you want to focus on to know that the gray fox is that big, long black stripe on its tail. It's not always visible, but that is the key distinguishing feature between it a gray fox and another fox species I'll cover in a second. There is another fox in this region. Um, you know, I've only ever seen one photo of a kit fox, but they are around. This is one photo from Wildlands Network that I had the pleasure of being able to identify. <laughs> it's not great. And besides being less common and found more in the deserts, they only have a black tip tail. You can't quite see it, but there's no black line on this Kit fox photo. However, on a gray fox, you'll always see that black line. And it's hard to tell sometimes from angles. Like I'll go back to this gray fox. You can't see the tail stripe on these, these two in the bottom, um, bottom left or bottom right. But that's where you have to consider range. Um, kit foxes are far less common. They're found in the deserts. So unless you're in maybe the Sonoran Desert or in those regions you might have a fox, it's probably a gray fox. And, it's probably a safe bet, this is called a gray fox. 
But if you do get a kit box, please let me know. I'd love to see more photos. So now we're going to switch to cats. Um, I'm just going to cover the two most common cats in this region. Uh, first, we're going to do the mountain lion. Um, they're pretty iconic and they're one of the largest animals out there. But it, from a camera, it's sometimes hard to know the scale just based on where it is. So mountain lions have the long distinctive tail. They have large solid bodies and their back ends are usually a lot stockier than their fore ends. Um, they have nice rounded ears and a solid tan white color. And I've noticed that their heads tend to be a lot smaller. Well, they have small heads compared to their body. Um, and they have a long distinctive cat, they're very cat-like body shape and nice and lanky. And I didn't have a question asking you what traits you're seeing, but as we go through the presentation and see all these pictures, think to yourself what of these traits um, you like looking at best and what makes it these animals. So then the, the second cat in this um, that's pretty common that we see on cameras is the bobcat. They're adaptable, they're found from the mountains to the cities, and hopefully if you have your cameras out long enough, you'll see one come through your area. They are known for their distinctive pointed ears. They have little tufts on the end. Um, they have nice big cheek fur. Oops. If you are a fan of the U of A Wildcats, you know that that distinctive cheek fur makes up the logo. They have really distinctive dark forearm bars. And, and a lot of times at night pictures, that's what is the one thing that'll stand out. And of course, they have their distinctive short little tail. Uh, but sometimes the tail is invisible. So you want to look at some of these other traits like this. It's kind of a terrible photo of a cat, but you can know it's not a mountain lion because you don't see a big long tail hanging off on the end. And just to let you know that bobcats are also spotted. While there are, hopefully there are ocelots and jaguars in this region, um, bobcats are far more common. I've seen some bobcats that look like ocelots because of how far, how much they're spotted. But you look for that tail in those pointed ears, and they'll tell you. So now we're going to do our first quiz. Um, we're going to test what you've learned. And Anna is going to be putting up some quizzes on what animal you think this is. So it's a, do you think it's a coyote or a gray fox? This is really where you want to look at the surrounding environment and look at those traits that we covered. Got six out of 15 people voted, so. Seven. Wait a few more seconds. What do you think? There's a pretty strong majority to one, one of these answers. Oh, one vote. All right, so we'll go ahead and end the poll. So this is a gray fox. Um, did get two votes for coyote, so I'll cover why it's a gray fox. So the thing I look for when I was IDing this picture was that big long tail. Um, it's hard to tell though, it doesn't look like it could touch the ground, but based on these short little legs and the small kind of head, just knowing the, uh, the surrounding area, this is a pretty small little canine. So this is a gray fox. And this is where context really comes, import, um, comes into importance. I know it's not a kit fox because this is high up in the oak woodlands where kit foxes aren't, aren't going to be. So it's where knowing your surrounding area and knowing the species that all appear there really comes in handy. So very good. Most people say gray fox. So next question, we're going to do this one. I'm going to do a feline. Is this a bobcat or a mountain lion? And most pictures are not going to be the picture, picture perfect ones that um, you see on Instagram. This one's not great. You can't see whole body. A few more questions. Well, it's going back and forth. All right, I'm going to end the poll. It looks like. Bobcat won by a narrow margin, but for a while it was mountain lion. So this is a bobcat, but this picture you don't you can't see the full tail, so it's hard to know. And it's kind of at a bad angle. Um, so the, the how I knew it was a bobcat there are the ears. If you look at the ears, there's a 
And this kind of area right here, there's a little tuft and they're also pretty pointed. And here you can see the cheek fur coming down. Um, and then the tail is pretty short, but it's kind of hard to know um, without seeing the full thing. But mountain lions tend to have a lot thicker base on the tail because it's a lot longer. And also you can see just this faint spotting on this black cat. So this was a tricky picture. Um, but definitely look for those ears, and the cheeks, and the spots. Next question. Is the same camera, different species? Is this a coyote or a gray fox? Another one where the tail's cropped off. All right, I think we're getting pretty solid answers on which this one is. It's a coyote, you guys are correct. Um, it's also kind of a weird angle, but you can see the nice big ears, the really long snout, and just the general color. It's much shaggier and kind of like grayish brown. That's typical of coyotes. And there's no tail stripe. Coy a gray fox would have that nice black tail stripe. So good job, guys. All right, last question for the cats and canines. Is this a bobcat or a mountain lion? It's kind of tricky. It's at night, it's kind of far away, and there's vegetation blocking most of it. And I feel like most of the pictures are of the animal coming into frame. You never get the nice full body shots, unfortunately. All right, we can call it. This is a mountain lion. Most of you guys got that correct. Um, it's still a tricky picture. It's hard to see the ear, the ear shape, but you can look at that head. It's pretty small and mountain lions have a distinctive head and neck posture. So really one, and they're not as shaggy as bobcats because they're a lot bigger in their furs, shorter in comparison. Um, so this is where coming, looking at bad photos really helps practice, um, helps you practice. So before we move on to the next species, does anyone have any questions about these two common cats and canines. I don't think so. Molly, do we have any questions? One question, do you use eye shine colors to help ID things? Um, I don't because uh, most of the Sky Island cameras are black and white. Um, <clears throat> so I have never really had the opportunity to look at colors, but that might be an interesting thing to look at. I think some species have different colors, but I, I don't rely on that. Um, I wouldn't do that as a trait either, just, just in case different individuals have different colors. I'm not quite sure how that is inherited. So, great, right, that was a good question though. So, we're gonna cover some other various mammals that might show up on your camera. <clears throat> so a pretty common family or group of species in the Sky Island regions are the Procyonids and the Procyonidae. And that name sounds kind of weird, but it's basically the raccoon family. And raccoons are found all over the United States, but here in the, the Southwest, we're lucky to have both the ringtail and the coati, which are neotropical species. <clears throat> then they're all known for their distinctive kind of striped tails and their kind of mask features. Um, once you come apart, it's, it's pretty easy because the ringtail is the smallest of the three. It has a very cat-like or almost weasel-like appearance and has that huge bushy black and white tail um, and that's kind of a tan. They're very cute. And then raccoons are found mostly by water sources. They're very common in urban areas because of pools and ponds. But they have a much larger gray body with their short, shorter little black and white tail. And of course, the distinctive bandit mask. And my personal favorite are the coatis, the white-nosed coati. They have a very distinctive, long kind of brontosaurus-like tail I've seen. And um, long, narrow snout and white bandy. And one interesting note is that both ringtails and raccoons are mostly nocturnal, so they're active at night. So you'll probably see them at nighttime if you see the black and white tails. But coatis are diurnal, and they'll only appear usually during the day. In all my experience, I've only seen like three or four 
uh, pictures of a Kaladi at night. That's probably because they're going home to sleep. So that's something to keep in mind as a life history. So another um, very interesting mammal that only comes into the Southwest just a little bit, but it's more common in Mexico and Sonora is the Virginia opossum. They're very common in the East, but here in, in the Scott Island regions, we have a special subspecies called the Mexican opossum that sometimes known as. And they're a little bit more distinctive than their Eastern counterparts. They're darker and a bit more kind of disheveled overall. They have a long skinny tail. And one thing to look for is that it's two colors. And here, oops, excuse me, um, it transits from some dark to light. And they have long pointed faces and you can't quite see, but um, they have some stripes along their eyes and their foreheads. And they can sometimes be confused with pack rats. And they can look like a rat, but this is where scale really comes into handy because they're much larger than a rat or other, um, other mammals. So here I've imposed two pictures of a pack rat on the same <clears throat> location as an opossum picture. You can see it's about twice the size. And they're pretty uncommon, so if you get them, um, it's pretty cool because they're definitely threatened by the border wall that's being built. So next is the javelina. They are a common resident in the, in the Sky Island region, and hopefully you can get them on your cameras. They are not a pig, but the pig-like cousin in the peccary family. And they have a very distinctive body shape, very large body, big triangular head, and delicate little legs. So once you recognize their silhouette and their shape on camera, hopefully you will never forget it. And they have that nice distinctive white collar, which they're known for. And sometimes they puff up like uh, porcupines, which is kind of fun. And another animal with big body shape are the black bears. These are mostly found in the mountains. So if you have a camera up in the oak woodlands, hopefully you can get a black bear eventually. But they don't just come in black. They can range from a light cinnamon to this nice kind of, kind of uh, amber color all the way to brown to black. And um, a lot of times they come out and check the cameras. So sometimes if you see a big fuzzy shape of fuzzy round ears like here, it's a black bear. They like to scratch on the trees and check out the cameras. And that's why if you have a camera out in the oak woodlands, you really want to have a security bear box, they're called, to prevent a bear from checking the camera for you. And something to keep in mind is that these bears are um, walking on their full heels of their feet. So sometimes they look kind of like a human. This one photo on the bottom right, it's a wet bear coming out of a spring. It looks kind of like a Sasquatch. So they're the biggest thing out there besides mountain lions. So um, you see a fuzzy Sasquatch, it's probably a bear. So next, uh, Actually, I should ask Emily, do we have any questions about those miscellaneous mammals before I move on? Just a comment that there's some love and appreciation for the baby javelina that appear on cameras because they're so fun to watch. Yeah, I love those. They're so cute and they're always so tiny. It's like, how are they so tiny? <laughs> I didn't include any pictures, unfortunately. So next, I'm just going to briefly cover some birds. Um, especially two that can sometimes be mis, um, misidentified because they're found on the ground and you know, turkey birds, as I like to call them. Uh, we have the gold turkey in the Sky Island region. They're one of the larger turkey species. And they have um, a distinctive bluish red head and these nice waddles. Both females and males will have a little bit of uh, a fleshy head. The males can get a lot, a lot bigger as the breeding season goes on. And they have very distinctive white tipped feathers and tail feathers. That's something to look for. And here in this bottom photo, um, they have, you can see in the light, there's this nice iridescence to their, their coat. And they have a lot longer legs. But sometimes there's also turkey vultures that land on the ground. <clears throat> if you're not quite familiar with where you are or what you're looking at, they sometimes can look like turkeys. That's why they're called turkey vultures. But they have a solid pink head and distinctive um, pink, it's like solid pink with a light little bill. And they're overall in solid dark brown color. And they have much shorter legs because while they can land on the ground, they're meant for flying. They're not primarily on the ground. So look for those shorter legs and that 
um, solid brown color as opposed to the kind of multicolor brown, <coughs> brown and white of the turkeys. But both are very cool and useful neat birds. So you might ask, what about other birds? Um, there can be countless birds that show up on your camera, especially if it's in front of water. Unfortunately, I'm not a bird expert and I'm still learning too. So I really recommend having a field guide available. I've had a field guide on next to me for the last couple of years and it's been fun to use that. Um, I recommend looking ones for specifically for your region and to know like what, where these birds might be. So use Google or find a field guide or another birding expert to help you out. And consider time of year migration. Um, some birds might not be here because of, they might be migrating somewhere else. And one little tip that works for bird pictures, but it works for all other pictures as well, is to zoom in and to brighten the image. Um, a lot of uh, photo software, even just the basic preview, have a you know, image way to brighten the image, and that can really bring out detail and to show the best view. Um, so good luck with this it's kind of expert birdie mode because a lot of times these birds are far away and blurry. So it's kind of a fun challenge. All right. So now I'm going to transition in the presentation to some of the harder species that are, to, that are hard to tell apart. Um, these are ones that still challenge me. So hopefully that I can give some advice on how to help you guys too. So first we're going to start with the antelope jackrabbit another jackrabbit. Um, so the antelope jackrabbit is a very cool um, hare species. They're found um, in a pretty small region of the southwest in northern Mexico and um, they're a lot limited in range compared to the other species we're about to cover. And the one, the two traits that I've learned and that we should, we should always look for are the white rimmed ears. You can see in this middle photo there's some nice white edging and they have distinctive silver sides. It's much easier to see in the daytime. So here in the bottom, bottom left, you can see both the silver lined ears and the silver kind of white um, sides on the, leg, the legs and the flank. However, it's hard to tell at night when they're moving about quickly when they're blurry because they're mostly nocturnal. So you'll probably see them mostly at night. And this is where you want to really look for both those clues of the white and the white. Also, if you can see that from behind, they have a lot shorter tail uh, compared to the other one. But I also feel like antelope jackrabbits are a bit more, they're larger and they're a bit blockier um, in size. They look like kind of like dogs when they're moving about. I really like them. And then the second species of jackrabbit that's pretty commonly found is the black-tailed jackrabbit. <clears throat> they're very similar to the antelope they're a tiny bit smaller, but that's hard to tell on the camera. But they have black tipped ears. They have much larger black points almost um, on their ears. They don't have the white sides, but they're kind of more grayish brown and tan overall. <clears throat> and their tail is a lot longer, about a couple inches longer. And it has a very obvious black, black um, top and a black line kind of running up their back. Antelope jackrabbits have it too, but their tail isn't as long. So here in the top photo, you can see it's kind of a far away picture, but the tail is pretty long. That's how I can tell um, that it's a, a black tail. And then hopefully you can get a good shot of the ears, the nice you know, black points. Sometimes it can look silver here, but again, I'm looking at those big black tips of the ears. So I'm going to do another quiz to see if you can look at some of these uh, jackrabbits. And I don't blame you if you don't know because these are an tough animals to ID. All right. Pretty neck and neck. Watch well, not neck and neck, but interesting to see what people are saying. All right, I think we should call it. So every, most people said black tail, but this is actually an antelope jackrabbit. It's kind of, I left it full screen. I didn't zoom it in to make it a bit of a challenge, but here you can see that really distinctive white side. And then here you can't quite see the, the ears and some, that might look like a black tip, but that's the shadow of the second ear. 
Um, but here you really want to look at that kind of distinctive white flank. They're named after they're named antelope jackrabbits because they look kind of like the antelope that are found in Africa with that distinctive kind of white belly and sides. Maybe that might be a good um, ID clue. And uh, just one thing to say is that antelope jackrabbits are found more in the grasslands and more open areas, maybe not so much in the deserts. So they're less, less common than the blacktail. So here's the next quiz. Another jackrabbit. All right, three boats, four. Okay, got pretty consistent boats. What do you think it is? Look at the ears, look at the tail, look at the sides. All right, I think we can call this one. Everyone was correct. It's a black-tailed jackrabbit. They're, this is a really nice photo of one. You can see the big, long black tail. Um, and you can kind of see the black ear tips, but it doesn't really have that distinctive white side flanks. It's paler, but it's not that really crisp line. All right, so before I move on to the next um, animal, do I have any questions? And it's okay not to know, I'll say this again, it's, these rabbits are hard and hopefully you get more than one picture just to have, help you identify what they are. Some of these quiz questions are unfair because I only have one snapshot. Meanwhile, there's like hundreds of pictures of them running around. So use, I'll use all the clues you can get. You have any questions? So, all right, next we're going to, moving down the size scale, we're doing squirrels. There's a lot of squirrels in this region, but I'll cover a couple. So first we're gonna look at the Abert squirrel versus the Arizona gray squirrel. They're both tree squirrels, um, but once you know a bit about their life history and some basic ID um, skills, you'll be able to know which one's which. So the Abert squirrel is found mostly in pine forests and higher elevations here in the Sky Islands. Um, they're more, much more common northern, northern Arizona and the rest of Western North America. But here they're pretty much in the pine forests. And they have distinctive big tufted ears um, and they have a rusty colored patch on their back. And they're known for their big silver banner-like tail. Um, if you've been to Mount Lemmon near Tucson, you've probably seen these um, Abert squirrels. They're pretty common. However, there's the, we also have the Arizona gray squirrel. They're much, um, they're much less common and they're found in the oak woodlands and riparian areas of the mountain, the region. So lower elevation and different habitat type. And they don't have ear tufts and they have a grayish brown body. Um, with more orange overall, while the Averts only has it on their back. <clears throat> their tail has a bit more color. So they're pretty similar, but look at where they're found and hopefully you can get a good glimpse of their ears. I don't have any wildlife camera pictures of Averts because we don't have cameras at high elevation, fortunately. So next we're gonna go on to the two squirrels that get uh, most commonly mis mixed up. And first we're gonna cover the rock squirrel. Rock squirrels are um, very common squirrels. If you've lived in an urban area, you've probably seen them. They, they're very adaptable to parks and lands, uh, neighborhoods, but they are found in the wild. They love rocky landscapes and canyons, and they're often found perched on rocks, and they're aptly named. So uh, the things I look for for rock squirrels is that they have a pretty distinctive two-toned body. They have a kind of checkered black, white, and gray front half, and a big orange or yellowy orange brown, how to describe it, rump in back half. You can see it in these um, two left photos. It's pretty distinctive that I think it helps break up their body shape and help them camouflage a bit more in the landscapes. Also, their coat has a very distinctive white flecked, kind of like granite. And this is all to help them camouflage. They're, they're ground squirrels, they live on the ground, they nest in the ground. So they have to kind of blend into the rocks that they live in. And a trait I always look for is their tail. 
This is a nice photo of one on the rock. And it has that kind of staticky white, black, and gray border. You can also see the brown in it. I'm not sure, it's like static or salt and pepper. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. But that's um, once you can recognize that tail coloration and flecking, um, it's pretty distinctive. Because when you compare them to another, the Arizona gray squirrel, they share the same habitats if they're in the oak woodlands and riparian canyons. Um, and they can look very similar. I've had a lot of questions telling them how to tell them apart, and it's tricky. But the gray squirrel has a more solid gray color overall. Yes, they have the white flecks, but it's not the same as that kind of brown granite color. And they don't have that distinctive kind of bisected coat pattern. Um, they're also, they're, they're named gray squirrels because they're gray fluffy um, tail that is flecked with brown, but it's less, they're less brown overall than a rock squirrel. They have nice white undersides, but these, these squirrels are tree squirrels. They live in the trees and they only come to the ground to forage and look for nuts and stuff. So they have much longer legs that are made for jumping through the canopies. And I've kind of noticed they often hold their tail up high, like a little banner to help them balance. Not a trait from being in the trees. Um, meanwhile, rock squirrels tend to be a little bit more low to the ground, slinky. Um, so this is really a squirrel that if you have both in the same area, it can be kind of tricky, but to really focus on looking at their tails and looking at their overall kind of behavior. And also to remind you that gray squirrels are only really found in the oak woodlands and they're a much smaller um, territory range. So. If you think you have an Arizona gray squirrel when you're in central Tucson, it's probably a rock squirrel. Uh, so. so here's a couple more quizzes. Let's see if we you can guess. So it's a rock squirrel or a gray squirrel. It's a tricky because it's nice, it's in a nice riparian area, but look at the body, look at the tail. Only five, six votes. Okay, I think we can call it. It is a rock squirrel. And you can kind of tell because it has that more orange body color overall. And you can see that kind of bisected color, the orange rump, orange brown rump and tail. And it's not big and fluffy and silver. This is kind of a, it's not as fluffy as rock squirrels can get, but you can still really see that nice kind of brown um, color. Here's the next question. Same thing, is this a rock squirrel or a gray squirrel? Most squirrel pictures for me look like this. They're just running blurs. They're not always in a hurry. Okay, I've got seven votes. Anyone else? Okay, I think we can call it now. Yep, everyone's right. It's a gray squirrel. Here you can really see that gray color. Even though it's blurry, you can, um, that really stands out. And that kind of silvery um, outlined tail is pretty distinctive of the Arizona gray. And I know it's not an Abert squirrel because this camera is in, is not high enough in the, it's not in the pine forest. So I can rule that out. out. Um, you just gotta have to use some of those assumptions when looking at species. All right, here's a third bonus question. It's right up against the picture. So what do you think it is? Rock squirrel or gray squirrel? This is at this picture. It's pretty silly. I feel like squirrels also give the best like selfies as they look into the, the camera. All right, I'm gonna call this quiz. You guys are all right, it is a rock squirrel. This is a great, a great picture, even though it's blurry, but you can really see that kind of flecked white and there's some black in there, that really flecked coat. Um, reminds me of like salt and pepper and granite, but good job. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the ground, some more ground squirrels. Um, well, the rock squirrel is a ground squirrel. They're much larger and they're pretty distinctive once you get to know them. So now I'm going to cover the smaller ground squirrels that are found more in the lowlands of um, the Sonoran Desert. 
So first we have the round-tailed ground squirrels. They look kind of like prairie dogs, but they're much smaller. They're not prairie dogs. I've gotten several arguments about that. But they have a nice solid tan body and white undersides. And they have a long, very long skinny tail. It's sometimes black tipped. Um, you kind of see in this top photo, there's a little black tip at the end. And they have very small ears and they're, since they're used to bear burrowing underground. And they um, are usually found in very large social burrows. We're driving by the side of the road. I can see them out and about. And then the other ground squirrel that's pretty common in the Sonoran Desert is the Harris's antelope squirrel. Um, but they're pretty, they're pretty different from the round tails. They have almost a chipmunk-like appearance. They have a striped body and they hold their fluffy tail above their body as they run. And they have a pretty distinctive white eye ring. Um, both, these, both these squirrels are active at the hottest part of the day. I always admire them. Um, it's a defense strategy from predators and you still see them during the day. But they're pretty different. So just once you look at the body, body color, you'll know. So I did mention chipmunks. Um, we, I don't have any pictures of the chipmunks, so we're just gonna go off the information. But if you're ever worried about what's a ground squirrel and what's a chipmunk, look at the elevation and where they're at. These antelope squirrels are found in the deserts in pretty low elevation, while chipmunks are usually at much higher elevations <clears throat> up in the mountains. So they'll, they'll, probably, they'll, they'll probably never overlap. And the ground squirrels are um, have much smaller ears. They don't have a white, you know, but they have, don't have a striped face. And there's some difference in the stripe, um, in the body stripings. And meanwhile, the chipmunks have much more striking face, and taller ears, since they don't have to go burrowing underneath the ground. But I think really just focus on elevation and know what's around you. So I'm just going to stop here and see if there's any questions about those squirrels before I move on to the next animal. Any questions, Emily? Okay. Cool. No so going into the hard mode for some of these species are deer. The deer are the most common yeah, animal I see on the camera. So yeah, like I have to get you have to get used to trying to identify what animal you're seeing. Um, so first we're gonna start with the mule deer. They're usually found at lower elevations here in the Sky Islands, so the deserts and the grasslands. But they can go up into the oak woodlands. But keep in mind that they're usually at lower elevations. And the biggest trait to look for is if you can see their, ta their tail is their um, kind of rope-like tail that's been described with a big black tip at the end. Um, they have kind of more of a white rump. And that's kind of the, the biggest trait to, that I always look for if I can see their, their rump. I've also noticed if you have a nice daytime photo or this is a night photo with flash, they kind of have more orangey tan legs than a white-tailed deer. We'll do some comparisons later. Um, I'm only mentioning ears now. They're named mule deers for their large ears, but I don't use that usually as a ID trait. Um, it's hard to know if deer's ears are large. And you can't compare the two species side by side. So while it is a trait to consider, it's not what I go off of. But I have noticed, um, as I was putting this presentation together, that it seems like they have kind of white ear tips. Not all the times, but I've been noticing that, especially like in night photos, you can kind of see that white tip of the ear um, and kind of edging. So one technical thing that a lot of hunters and other um, people use is the metatarsal gland. I'll go over in more detail in a second about what that is but mule deer have a longer metatarsal gland that's higher up in their body. That's only on the outside of their back legs. So if you have a leg only in shot, that's something you'd use, but I focus on the tail and the um, mother treats too. So then I'm just gonna look at these two males at the, on the, over here. Mule deer have a very distinctive antler shape. As they grow, they fork as the tines come out. So you can see this little diagram. They kind of grow like a tree. So each tine has a fork, because a fork has a fork. Um, however, and they usually tend to be a lot bigger than, than white-tailed deer antlers. But 
sometimes it's kind of hard to tell if the males are not, male antlers are not big enough to fork yet. So antlers are a good clue if they do have that fork, but it's not something I always look at. Um, Cause like when IDing animals, you want to consider all these traits together. Don't just use one. And then one last thing is that mule deer tend to have these very dark eyebrows. You can kind of see on these two males down here, they have kind of like grumpy black eyebrows, but it's usually just because their forehead is darker colored than their nose. Um, compared to the white-tailed deer, these are usually found higher at ele in elevation um, in the mountains usually, and they're much smaller and kind of more delicate than mule deer in my opinion, especially when you see them on camera. They don't have that distinctive dark eyebrow and forehead color, but they have a really pretty delicate white nose band. I don't, I don't usually use the nose band, but sometimes it can help. Um, and of course, they're known for, they're called white-tailed deer because they have a very fluffy white underside that when they raise, um, it's like a big cotton ball. It's pretty iconic. And here you can see the metatarsal gland again. It's not the best shot, but it's shorter and much lower. The next slide, I'll talk about it more. And here for the male antlers, um, they only have one beam and one time. They don't fork. So they can look like they're forking, but if you kind of follow, if you have an antler in hand, it's easy to see, but you follow that one main beam as it comes across. So these are all white tail. But it's tricky to tell when the antlers are just growing. It's like, okay, not the best trait. But here, this I can tell it's a white tailed deer because it has that kind of white nose band. And it's much skinnier than a mule deer, or much more elegant. So you might be asking like, where the heck and what the heck is a metatarsal gland? Um, I took me years to try to figure that out. And it's a scent gland on the outside of the legs of these deer. And they use it to mark territories, they want to buy things and just to communicate. And it could be a good clue if you can't see the tail and you can't see the other front end of the deer. Um, so like here on this mule deer, it can't quite Maybe you can see that black tip, but it's hard to know. But here you can see the metatarsal gland. It's just kind of this long uh, kind of shape in the leg. And it's a lot higher up near the joint of this leg. Well, but on a white-tailed deer, we'll just ignore the tail if you do. The, the gland is much smaller. It's only like a little bump down here. Um, I don't usually look at that, but I wanted to point that out to people because um, that might be a good trait as you come across these. So I always, if, if, but hopefully the, if you can see the back leg, you can also see the tail. So I'd go off the tail first if it's in view. All right, so now we're gonna do a whole bunch of quizzes on mule deer versus white tails. Hopefully that can, um, I can teach people as we go along and get some more experience. So what do you think this deer is? It's not the best picture, it's the full, Full profile. Okay, we got some questions in. Can we get up here? One more person. All right, I think we can call it. Yep, yeah, it's a white tailed deer. And the way you can kind of tell is the body shape overall is a bit smaller. Like I say it's more elegant, but it's not, not always a great way to describe it but the ears are a bit, it's a bit smaller. Um, you can actually kind of see that metatarsal gland. It's pretty small and low down. And also the tail, even though it's not held up at all, you can kind of see that long kind of fluffy tail. You zoom in. So it's a good job. It's also, we're up in the kind of juniper oak. That's another clue. All right, another question, nighttime. What do you think it is? Mule deer or white tail? So here we have three, three individuals. And in this series of photos, they were all sparring. A bunch of little males. It was kind of fun to see. All right. I'm going to call it since people are all correct. These are all mule deer. Um, this one's pretty easy. You can see 
white tailed black tip, you know, kind of that light blue rump. Um, here, in these nighttime pictures, you can kind of see those lighter color legs as well. It's something I look for. Um, also, these male antlers, they're not fully branched out, but they have a bit different shape than the white tail. All right, next picture. Two more boys. Their antlers are all small though, so they're not very great um, clues. So what else do you look for? Okay, got two votes anymore. This one's tricky because you can't see their butt at all. Okay, I think we're gonna call it. So these are two mule deer. Um, they're Young or young males, they don't have their antlers fully grown yet. So what I look for is these dark, the dark forehead. Again, um, those eyebrows are kind of a good trait to look for. Their ears are big, but it's kind of hard to tell compared to a white-tailed deer, um, especially in the southwest. White tails can have bigger ears just to help disperse heat. There's no tail visible. So then I also look at that black leg. It's probably the metatarsal gland. It's long. It's pretty high up. But I used the, the forehead to, when I made this identification. So, two mule deer. So, these guys are up in the oak woodlands. Um, this is from the Mortar Wildlife Study, and they've migrated up into the higher elevations this last few months. It's been interesting to see why. I don't know why. So, here's the same camera, different guy. Oh, who is this? He's giving a good side eye to the camera. Okay, we have 50 50. Let's have to go a few more units. Okay, I think we can call this one. It's, this is a white tailed deer. Um, this one's another side profile, but here you can see the kind of white, fluffy butt a little bit more, um, the longer tail. You don't see any obvious white tail, black tip. Um, also, this one has a kind of a white nose band. It's not always obvious. And their ears are smaller. And um, overall, I feel like once you get an eye for identifying deers, it becomes a little bit more obvious about body shape and behavior. And this one just kind of rings white tail, even if you can't see the rump. Okay, a couple more deer photos. Most of the time, they like to um, do nice selfies, and you can't see the rumps at all. So we're gonna do some mug shots. What do you think this gentleman is? I always like the deer, even though they're really common there. They're always fun to look at. Okay, this one's pretty close. I think I'm gonna call it, so we can talk about it. So this is a mule deer, um, but a lot of people said white tail, so I'll go over it in detail. Um, so the antlers aren't great. You can't see the forking at all. There might be a tiny bit one here, but it kind of looks like a white tail antler. So I had to go to a different feature. Um, so next thing, move down in those dark eyebrows compared to the rest of the face and the nose. Um, that's pretty distinctive of mule deer. So I'm like, okay, I'll use that. And then <clears throat> the ears are pretty big. Um, and I just noticed again, like these kind of white ear tips are pretty distinctive of a mule deer. Um, so this is a mule deer, but you kind of want to use all the traits. And this camera is found in the, in the near Green Valley. So it's pretty low in elevation too. So that's another key, key trait that I didn't tell you guys. So this is hard mode. All right, another mug shot. A different male. You can't quite see his antlers. Most deer photos are like this. You can't see all the, the great traits that's look for. So what do you think this is? This one's tricky. You can just denote it's 1025. Oops, okay, I'll keep moving then. We'll just do this one male. Let's end it. All right, so this is a white-tailed deer. Um, the ears are pretty big, but doesn't have the dark eyebrows, like the dark forehead. It has a little white nose band. So I'm gonna skip that last question to go on the skunks because that's the hard one. I don't wanna uh, miss these guys. So here we have, in the Sky Island regions, we have four skunks, the hooded skunk, the striped skunk, hognose skunk, and spotted skunk. 
So I just want to quickly cover the striped skunks. They're pretty common, but they have a very distinctive black line on their uh, back end of their bodies. It kind of forms, and they have a very distinctive white kind of V or Y uh, stripe. That's usually what I look for is that black stripe with the white Y shape. And that white will always meet above their shoulders and their head. It won't come down on their, on their arms. Oops, two daisies. I was just going crazy. Um, also their body length or their, it's about the same as their tail length. They have very fluffy tails, but in comparison to their body, it's about the same. And they have a very distinctive white face stripe. But look at that, look, always look for that little black stripe on the, on the rump. Because they can be often confused with hooded skunks. Um, whoops, hooded skunks in the region can come in a variety of colors, but they can also, they um, can have like a white back or white sides. And they also have a white face stripe. However, their white stripes never come over their shoulder, over their shoulders. They'll stay at the side. But if there is one with a white back, it won't have that white, that, that distinctive black stripe. So here's a striped skunk again. It has that little black stripe on the butt. But here's on this hooded skunk, there's no black stripe on the butt. And their tail is much longer than, than their body. Um, it's like almost twice the length and it's much shaggier and fluffier. They can always look like caterpillars. And then the next skunk is the spotted skunk. They are the smallest um, skunk species here and they're pretty unmistakable. They have that really nice marble coat and a white face spot. And they have a very short fan-like tail. And mostly they look like blurs as they go running through cameras. Um, but hopefully, I, I had never gotten them confused with other skunks. Hopefully you won't either. However, the fourth one is the hognose skunk. They can look similar to other, the other two, um, striped and hooded. However, really pay attention to the traits of the hooded or the hognose. Because um, once you've learned them, it'd be hard to mistake them. So they have a short, all white tail. Their tail is shorter than their body, which is different than the other two. And they're always going to be all white. They might be a tiny bit of black, but the kind of white bottle brush. And their fur on their body is a bit shorter than the other hooded and striped skunk. Um, it gives that really crisp kind of white line. And also, in my opinion, the white on their head kind of forms like a cap between their ears. It doesn't extend past. And it's very neat. And then, of course, they have a very large bear nose, which gives them their hog nose name. Um, but that's not always in view. They also have a much stockier body, kind of like a badger, which is also what I look for. So um, I might skip a couple of these questions. I want to get to my last slide. I'm just giving some general advice. Um, so it's OK not to know. These pictures are tricky, and this takes practice. So and sometimes the picture is just terrible, like this jacket, but I'm not really sure what it is. So just use your best guess and move on. Don't spend all day on this. And it's OK to ask for a second opinion. Um, if you have species you want help with, please email me. Uh, my email is right there. She posted in chat. I love helping people. It's like a detective work, so I enjoy it. I also recommend posting pictures on iNaturalist. That's a community um, website, and you can get a lot of expert opinions there. And then also ask other experts, like politely, of course. But um, if you know, if you have a friend who's a good birder or a person who works with mammals, um, ask them. It's this is a learning experience, so. I always recommend people to reach out and to keep learning and to keep identifying. Uh, so I want to say thank you and happy wildlife ID. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. That was amazing. Um, we do have one question I think that if you could comment on would be really helpful. So with the skunk species in particular, how is there any general guidance about the elevations or ecosystems they live in? Or is it all just based on the morphological traits? Yeah, it's, I wouldn't go off of elevation. Um, there might be slight differences in like habit, habitat, but I have never noticed um, a distinct difference. It really is the traits. Um, I hopefully want to put together a little more comprehensive guides on the skunks. Um, 
But yeah, really look at the stripings and the tails. It's the big thing because they're all found together. I have one camera I checked that has all four. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of overlap. Okay. Um, well, people really appreciate everything that you shared today. Uh, there's lots of kudos to you. Um, and then there was a question just to confirm the cameras that Sky Island is using, the Browning Strike Force, and if you have any suggestions for setting them up for best photos. Um, for the Brownings, uh, th that's most of the pictures you've been seeing the black and white ones at night, especially. Um, I, you can use any settings you want, but it's really how you put the camera up. I recommend putting it at animal height. Um, sometimes you can't, but if you can get it within like three to four feet off the ground, you can get those really nice pictures of animals moving by. And we have them at like one photo burst every like 30 seconds. And that seems to be good, good pictures. So I encourage people to experiment and play around to find what's best for them. Yeah, so if you when you set up your camera, plan to check it in 24 hours after it's had some time to operate because you might realize, oh, there's a bush right in front of it that's waving in the wind and <laughs> or you actually have it angled down and you need to tip it up a little bit. So it does take that tweaking like Megan said. It's a, it is an art form as well as a science. So it is. It takes some patience, but once you find that great perspective, you can just leave it there and let it roll and it's great. Um, there is a posting in the chat about a resource where Megan has gone over how to set up your own backyard camera. We've got examples from my own house about what's worked well. So we've got a lot of resources on our website. Check out our Skyland Photo Fauna project if you haven't already. And you can be submitting a really important checklist every month from your cameras to help us monitor wildlife throughout the region. So thank you very much, Megan. This was so exciting. I know I'm going to be re-watching that deer section. <laughs> over and over again. Um, we all really appreciate it. And we'll have the recording of this training up on our website later today. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day, everyone.